accompanied by Vlasov, the secretary of the Communist Party organization in the Alexandrovskoya district. Commander Sepkov returned to Nazino on May 31, after more than a week's absence. In the interim, an emergency meeting of the Office of the District Committee of the Party had been called into the Commandantura's administrative center to decide what to do about the declasse elements who had been unloaded on the island of Nasino. After listening to Sepkov's report, party officials ordered the commander to transfer within one week, that is, before June 5th, all the deportees to appropriate places designated by the settlement plan to mobilize the whole of the local population for baking bread and feeding the declasse elements. To requisition among the local economic organizations all the tools, construction materials, and instruments necessary for building shelters, cooking utensils, the cooking utensils required for preparing hot meals, and all available boats. The resolution adopted at the end of this meeting severely criticized Commander Sepkov, who was accused of incompetence and violating the party's resolutions concerning the reception of special settlers. Shortly after he arrived in Nazino, Vlasov sent a long report to the party secretary for the Norim region, Levitz, to inform him about the situation. At the time, early June, Sepkov had still not dared inform his superiors, that is, the leaders of the Siblog, and in particular, Ivan Dolgoik, the head of the Department of Special Settlers, of what happened. It was through party channels that Robert Ike, the boss of Western Siberia, learned around June 10 about the Nazino affair. The report Vlasov sent his superiors in the first days of June provided numerous details regarding the situation on the island at the time, that is, about two weeks after the arrival of the first convoys. At the date when the temperature was hovering around freezing, no hot meals had yet been distributed to the deportees. For lack, not only of provisions, but also of pots and utensils that could be used to cook food. After ovens in the few surrounding villages had been requisitioned, a few tons of bread had been allocated to the deportees, a ridiculously small quantity to feed so many mouths. For weeks, the vast majority of the deportees had to survive on a daily ration of flour. Sepkov and Vlasov had managed to bring back from Alexandrovskoya a few hundred tools, axes, shovels, saws, 400 pairs of lopti, and several bundles of clothes. Except for the lopti, these supplies were in quantities very insufficient to provide shoes for thousands of barefoot deportees. The few bits of cloth requisitioned in the nearly empty depots of the few cooperative storehouses in this part of the Soviet would be would of the Soviet world being of little use without a sewing machine, Sepkov admitted before the commission of inquiry. We couldn't do much with the cloth. As for the axes, which were indispensable for cutting wood and building shelters, was it reasonable to put them in the hands of socially dangerous elements? Who were cannibals to boot? It was finally decided not to distribute these tools to the deportees when they were transferred to the island of Nazino to their final settlement sites. For this transfer, Sepkov and Vlasov had succeeded in mobilizing about 20 more or less usable boats, each of which could carry a few dozen persons. It was on this fleet that the deportees were taken, starting in early July, to their final settlement sites. Five such sites up the Nazina River were chosen on the recommendation of Sulyaminov, who was well acquainted with the taiga and remembered places where there were a few hunters' huts 
and where the fishing was good. These places were between 60 and 100 kilometers from the island of Nazino, a distance that took boats several days to travel, going upstream against the current. Within two weeks, the island was almost completely emptied. On June 12th, there remained on Nazino only 157 deportees who could not be moved. During the transfer, several hundred detainees who were already very weak died. These deaths were in addition to some 1,500 to 2,000 deaths that had occurred since the disembarkation on the island and in additional to the hundreds of escapees who had disappeared. According to the testimony of Ivan Ovarov, the commandantura's assistant head accountant, 2,856 deportees were sent by boat from the island to points upstream on the Nazina River. At the end of June, a count was made of the deportees present, present in the various settlement sites. This count confirmed that about half of the approximately 6,000 persons set ashore on Nazino five or six weeks earlier had disappeared. When they arrived at their final settlement sites, the survivors found themselves in a situation almost identical with the one they had known on the island. The only difference being that they were, there were more left to their own devices, the few guards having returned to Nazino to get another group of deportees, leaving behind a few provisions and tools to construct shelters. It was during this stage in their long journey that a large number of deportees tried to escape on improvised rafts. Most of the fugitives perished when their rafts sank the guards shot them, or they got lost in the immensity of the Siberian taiga. In the meantime, word of what happened in Nazino had reached the region's highest political authorities. On June 12th, Robert Ike demanded an explanation for the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative for Western Siberia, Alexiev, and from the head of the Siblog, Gorchkov. While minimizing the incident, we asked that Alexandro Vakskoya Commandantura explain to the cases of negligence observed when a group of de classe elements received. The two officials of the Ogpu and the Siblog told Ike in a telegram. Alexiev and Gorshkov ordered Ivan Dolgoik, who was then making an inspection tour in the Commandanturas around Tomsk, to go to Nazino, assess the situation. Before the commission of inquiry, the head of the Sivlog's Department of Special Settlements recounted in detail his expedition to these remote places. The situation was critical everywhere. I had to go repeatedly to both Parabel and Karagasok, where typhus was raging among the deportees, and to the Galkinskaya Commandantura, where a situation was emerging that was, if not analogous to that, in the Alexandro Volkskaya Commandantura, at least approaching it. The question of provisions was critical there because the boats belonging to the Gospar, the State River Transportation Company, an organization with which the Siblog had signed a contract to manage, these matters were immobilized. The Gospar had just received a shipment of German motors, but it did not have the refined oil necessary to run them. After a short stop in Parabel, where about 2,800 deportees who had just been disembarked there were 230 sick with typhus, I went directly to Alexandrovskoya, along with several, several collaborators, about 20 experienced armed guards and all the backup personnel I could find. Since the Siblog had made no means of transportation available to them, Dolgoik and his team finally reached Alexandrovskoya after six days' voyage aboard the Karl Marx, the only boat making regular runs, two or three times during the nav navigable season between Tomsk and Alexandrovskoya. On June 21st, the inspection team 
which had been joined by Commander Sepkov and part of the Commandantura's apparatus, finally landed on the island of Nizino. A zealous Siblog official who had been taught always to report on plans, achievements, and figures. Dolgoik's first concern was to count the number of the deportees who had died on the island. He decided that the number of 1970 dead, all special settlers, reported by the health officers, was grossly exaggerated for obvious political reasons. The Siblog's officials making a tour of the island, guided by a certain Pokorovikili, Pokorovki, Pokorovki, a recidivist criminal serving as a nurse responsible for burials, counted the number of common graves. There were 31. One of them exceptionally large. The proceeded, they proceeded to exhume and count the bodies in three graves, one of them exceptionally large, another larger than average, and one smaller one. On the basis of the number of bodies exhumed from each of these graves, 55, 22, and 5 respectively, Dolgoik tried to show in written report he later submitted to the head of the Siblog that the number indicated by local staff was greatly exaggerated and emphasized that this was the only sensible argument he gave and emphasized and this was the only sensible argument he gave, that the grave diggers, all volunteers with criminal backgrounds, were naturally inclined to inflate the number of the dead and to include fugitives because the, different, because the differentiated and increased rations they'd received were determined by the number of bodies they had buried. This island's commander not undertaking any verification. After making this macabre tour, the officials asked to go to the settlement closest to Nizino, where a group of deportees had been sent a few weeks earlier. In a small motorboat, the team traveled up the Nizina, some 60 kilometers, to settlement site number one. Not without problems, because one of the snow, because once the snow had melted, the level of the river had considerably decreased, and sandbanks made navigation difficult and even impossible. The Siblog's, leader, the Siblog's leaders and their guards had to travel the last 10 kilometers on foot through the taiga and the ma marshes. Here is the description Dolgoik gave of his visit to the settlement site number one, which had been occupied since the beginning of June by a few hundred survivors from the island of Nizino. A virgin space along the river, a primitive day often, a, a primitive clay oven, rude huts made with pine branches under which the declasse elements refused to take shelter, preferring to gather in the, open, in the open around wood fires, a single wooden hut which serves as lodging for the commander and the guards. The contingent consists of the most declasse elements of the cities, truly the refuse of society. They all proudly advertise the fact that they come from Moscow or Leningrad. They are all extremely dirty, lice-ridden, emaciated, without shoes, dressed in rags. Some of them are naked. Since they had been there, it is, a, it is clear that none of them has washed, and despite the fine weather that has snow come, that has now come, none of these elements wants to bathe in the river. When they saw us coming, the declasses gathered together and began demanding that they be released, each one claiming that he had been exiled here for no good reason. Most of these elements refused to work, despite the commander's injunctions. We'd rather die than work, the boldest said openly. In any case, we've been brought here so that we'll die of hunger. We'll run away. That doesn't scare us. We've escaped the Slovaki more than once. I made a speech telling them that those who went to work would get increased rations, along with tobacco and clothing, 
and eventual liberation as well, while those who refused to work would receive only the minimal rations. As for those who tried to escape, they would be referred to the Ogpu's Troika. And just so everyone knows, a Troika is basically a a group of three people that they send around, like a judge, jury, and executioner, um, to basically assassinate and kill people that they consider declasse elements. Anyway, back to the story. Yeah, those who refused, who tried to escape, they would be referred to the Ogpu's Troika. I have to admit that very few reacted positively to my speech. Most of them are irrecorrigible or incorrigible. The rare individuals who agreed to work do so slowly and carelessly. Dolgoic's speech excited a few positive reactions, but he was above all interrupted by the seditious, the seditious shouts already mentioned. You're starving the people while we're eating one another. Thereupon the Siblog's high official had his armed guards arrest some 15 hotheads. Back in Nazino, Dolgoic made a few serious uh, made a series of decisions. Commander Sepkov was stripped of his functions and received a severe censure to be recorded in his personal party membership file. Looks like Periscope has died, but whatever. We'll keep doing this on the Instagram. Commander Sefkov was stripped of his functions and received a severe censure to be recorded in his personal party membership file. Um, the leadership of the Alexandrovskoya Commandantura was entrusted to an official who had come along with Dolgoik's team, a certain Frolov, a very young and energetic Czechist who has been promoted to the rank of commander in 1931 at the age of 22. It was decided to transfer the deportees once again to new settlement sites near the confluence of the Ob and the Nazina rivers. The settlement sites chosen by Sepkov and Sulomanov, which were considerably farther up river, were no longer accessible by transport boats, the water level having considerably dropped since the end of the thaw and could, the, and could therefore no longer be either supplied or supervised. Within one week, the new commander was expected to choose, with the help of a team of surveyors, new settlement sites at least 15 kilometers away from the confluence of the Ob and the Nazina, and construct settlement villages on them. The De Classe elements transferred to those sites would be subject to a stricter set of rules, that was part of the settlement village plan. Ringleaders and parasites who refused to work would be arrested and sent before a special Ogpu court. A system of differentiated provisions would be set up, determined by the work done by each individual. 750 grams of bread per day for those who worked, 600 for the weakened, 200 grams for simulators, the whole local population would be mobilized in the framework of the obligatory public labor usually imposed on the Kolkosians, as well as on special settlers and the indigenous minorities. In order to construct a landing stage, depots, public baths, and huts, to increase discipline among the guards, uniforms would be distributed to them. The long list of, de of decisions, in reality, a catalog of intentions for the realization of which the Siblog had no immediate plans to provide funding, concluded with a utopian prospective economy plan for developing the resources of the Alexandro Vahovskoya district in 1933. Before winter arrived, the de Classe elements a few samples of whom the commission had just seen during its visit to settlement site number one were supposed to have cleared 500 hectares and sowed them in rye. 
and accumulated sufficient reserves of wood for construction and heating, and of berries, mushrooms, and dried fish for the reason for the season when the river is not navigable and supply and resupply by the state is particularly difficult. After this meeting, Dolgoik and his team left again on board the Karl Marx, leaving the new commander Frolov with the difficult task of implementing the decisions they had made. Frolov was very energetic. Frolov, Frolov, who was very energetic, mobilized all of the available forces and succeeded in particular in convincing several economic organizations making use of special settlers to lend him for two months three construction brigades, about 60 men in all, hard-working, dekulakized peasants the, to build huts and bread ovens. In a few weeks, a settlement village, like those that sheltered the peasants, deported to this area in the first two waves of deportization in 1930 to 1931, rose up about 15 kilometers from Nazino. The, survivals, the survivors from settlement site number one, about 250 persons, were installed there around mid-July. However, Frovlov did not have time to transfer the approximately 2,000 survivors of the island of Nazino who were living farther up stream in settlement sites numbers two through five. In fact, during the first half of July, he had to deal with the arrival of three additional convoys of Declasse elements, some 4,200 individuals from the Tomsk transit camp that had been delayed for several weeks following the Nazino affair. Since the middle of May, when the first convoys were sent to the Narim region, the transit camps in Tomsk, Omsk, and Achinsk had continued to receive tens of thousands of deportees coming from Ukraine, the North Caucasus, the Volga regions, Moscow, and Leningrad. In all, nearly 100,000 persons. The peasant contingents, which represented more than 80% of the total number of deportees, had been distributed among a dozen commandanturas in the Narim region. Because they had generally arrived in poor physical condition and usually came from regions suffering from famines, the human losses among the peasants, among the peasant deportees in this third wave, as officials of the Special Settlement Department called it, were still higher than those of the preceding years. Through precarious, their installation Though precarious, their installation nonetheless took place under conditions more or less similar to those of the first two waves. As we have seen, the case was otherwise for the completely deprived urban de classe elements sent to the Alexandrovskoya Commandantura. Despite the assurances given by the Gulag's leadership, that no further contingents of this type would be sent to Western Siberia. The Tomsk camp received during the month of June alone more than 6,000 additional Class A to Class A elements, as many more in July. In a dispatch sent to Einrich Yagoda at the end of July, Alexiev, the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative for Western Siberia, once again protested against the sending of large numbers of aged and infirm persons and women with small children, of whom Moscow and Leningrad are ridding themselves. These elements, he added, have no value in terms of economic development. He cited in particular a convoy of 1,719 deportees that had left Moscow on July 9th and arrived in Tomsk a week later. A very large number of elderly persons had been counted, along with numerous invalids, blind persons, deaf, mutes, and mentally retarded persons. The great majority of these peoples who had arrived with family were women alone with small children, arrested while they were passing through Moscow, despite all the official documents and attestations certifying that these persons had a specific reason to go to the capital. More than 300 deportees in this convoy 
had to be transferred to the Siblog's dispensaries, hospices, and hospitals, which were already saturated. As for the others, they were to be sent to the Alexandra Vachovskoya Commandantura. The head of the Siblog wondered what economic benefit the Soviet state would derive from them. Around the middle of July, the Tomsk camp had already received other convoys from Moscow consisting exclusively of gypsies, 5,470 persons, including 1,440 men, and 1,506 women, and 2,524 children who had been expelled from the capital in the area around in connection with vast police operations that had begun on June 28 and was completed on July 3rd. The gypsies, without fixed domicile, the assistant head of the gulag explained, had been authorized to take along with them 338 horses, two cows, and a large quantity of miscellaneous objects. All the deportees have undergone disinfection and had their hair cut. The gulag has made available to this contingent of adequate quantity of food for humans and livestock in accord with the administrative norms and force. Each convoy has its own mobile kitchens and a sufficient number of dishes to provide the deportees with hot food and boiling water, as well as a quarantine car in the event of an epidemic. After a brief stop in the Tomsk transit camp, the approximately 5,000 gypsies were taken by river to settlement sites. In the Galkinskaya Commandantura, at the end of a few weeks, virtually all the gypsies had fled. In late July 1933, two additional convoys of declasse and socially harmful elements rounded up in Moscow and Leningrad. Nearly 3,000 individuals in all arrived in the Tomsk transit camp. The report sent on this occasion to Heinrich Yagoda by Pliner, the assistant head of the Gulag and the chief official of the Special Settlements Department, clearly raised the question of the ultimate fate of these groups of outlaws, deported to the other end of the country into veritable garbage can zones from which Many of them escaped, thus continually frustrating and discouraging the police forces, for whom the sole result of all these operations seemed to be, seemed be to shift criminals from one place to another. In Pliner's view, the socially harmful elements must no longer be sent to labor villages, but rather to camps in order not to contaminate through their per pernicious demoralizing influence other contingents of deportees. For the time being, Pliner's proposal was shelved, but it was quickly received as soon as the world of Nazino affair reached Stalin himself. According to the final version of the settlement plan for the new contingent of labor colonists, for the year 1933, worked out in May 1933 by the Siblog leadership, the Alexandrovskoya Commandantura was to receive a total of at least 20,000 deportees. The Nazino affair delayed for several weeks the dispatch of further contingents. However, at the end of June, a new convoy of 1,608 de classe elements was sent to Alexandrovskoya, this time, it seems, with a minimum of equipment, tools, and provisions for two months. This convoy was followed by two others that left Tomsk on July 14 and July 18. The three convoys were unloaded about 100 kilometers upstream from Nazino at the confluence of the Ob and the Panay rivers. According to reports submitted by Commander Frolov and by Vlasov, the local party boss 
the errors committed by, committed during the dispatch and reception of the first contingents of de Classes were not repeated. Thus, the deportees who had arrived in pitiful shape, more than a third of them were severely emaciated, in rags and without shoes. At the landing stage in Verkniasha Panay received buckwheat soup, 500 grams of bread, and, after two or three days, some dried fish. The places having been equipped with three public baths, a complete disinfection of the individuals and their clothing within two to three days of their disembarkation, was undertaken. Thanks to this perfectly controlled reception, Vlasov reported, only 23 individuals died over the first few days. In addition to four to the four who died during transport, most of whom were elderly people or young vagabonds who were very emaciated. At the end of the week, all the deportees were sent by boat to their final settlement sites, a few dozen kilometers up the Panay River. Two brigades of carpenters composed of deported peasants lent by the rib trust were supposed to help the declasse elements build huts, stoves, bread ovens. However, slightly qualifying his rosy picture of a perfectly controlled reception, Vlasov acknowledged that most of the deportees had refused to go to work and had tried to escape. Thus, Nekrasovka, a special village on the banks of the Panay, where 340 persons had been installed, hardly 90 participated in the construction of huts. Most of them spent their time fishing. Well, what do you think they're going to do? It's like, dig your own grave or get food that we're not going to give you. One week after their arrival at their final settlement site, 120 persons had already fled. The shortage of supervisory personnel and guards further aggravated the general atmosphere of sloppiness. Only 10 guards accompanied the convoy of 100 or 1,068 deportees unloaded at Verknashkia on July 4th. The guards had hardly arrived before they began asking to go back to Tomsk, refusing to go any further into the taiga to graze dangerous criminals there. Only the threat of immediate arrest for, desert, for desertion got them to remain. A last shadow in the picture the persistence of acts of cannibalism. On July 10, three deportees were arrested while they were eating human flesh. After running away from Verk Nyasha Panay, they had wandered, or wandered about in the taiga for several days, encouraging another group of fugitives. Oh, encountering another group of fugitives, they had, by common agreement, sacrificed a cow. The other cannibals were not found. By the way, a cow is a person that the rest of the group agrees to eat. Um, they call that a cow. It's better than calling it a human, I guess. Um, the other cannibals were not found. Cannibals roaming the taiga close to the special villages maintain a tense climate favoring all sorts of anti-Soviet rumors, Vlasov concluded. Hold on one sec while I try and get this back up and going. Cannibal Island. You know what? Screw it. I think the uh, I think Periscope's just not working, period. So we'll say one more shot. If I can't get it going, who cares? Let's see. Do another one. Oh, maybe if I turn my internet off and just go full, uh, not internet. Come on, come on. Periscope, let's do this. Doesn't look like it's going to do this. That's okay. Sorry for wasting that few seconds. Back to the book. At the end of a week... All the deportees were sent by boat to their final settlement sites, 
a few dozen kilometers. Wait a sec, did I already read that page? Oh yeah, yeah I did. Um, the other cannibals were not found. Cannibals roaming the taiga, which is a huge, like, icy, deserted, like most of Russia is the taiga, close to the special villages maintain a tense climate favoring all sorts of anti-Soviet rumors, Vlasov concluded. These field reports contrasted strongly with the dispatches exchanged at higher levels. For example, the document Gorchkov sent on July 11, 1933, to Matvey Berman, the head of the Gulag, who was passing through Novosibirsk on his way back from a tour to Vladivostok, stated that the Nazino incident is over and the situation is under complete control. The construction of huts, public baths, disinfection rooms, and storehouses is in full swing, as are the distribution of clothing and stockpiling of provisions for winter. Most of the special settlers are working hard. The development plans will be carried out soon. At the same time that the party's regional authorities and the Siblog were attempting, by common accord, to minimize and close the Nazino incident, Valcheco, the young journalist propagandist, was undertaking his own investigation of the situation of the work colonists in, in Alexandrovskoyev district. Did he do so on his own initiative, or was the inst investigation commissioned by the local newspaper, for which he also wrote? The answer to this question is not clear. But one thing is certain. The subject of the special settlers was far from being taboo. On the contrary, in a region which they constituted the majority of the local population, the deportees' economic success and their transformation into decent, hard-working Soviet citizens were regular topics of propaganda articles published in local press. Valchenko spent nearly three weeks in the Nazino area. He went not only to the island but also to five or six deportee settlement sites along, with, along the Nazina River. When he had completed his investigation, he wrote, not a propaganda article for the local newspaper, but a long report, which he sent simultaneously to his immediate superior, Levitz, the secretary of the party committee of the Nareem region, to Robert Ike and to Stalin himself, this was a bold act on the part of a minor bureaucrat who was only 25 years old, but it was not unprecedented. Stalin strongly encouraged communists of the base to send directly to him signals regarding what was going on on the local level, bypassing the party's hierarchy. He suspected regional officials of providing Moscow with only partial and embellished information. As a staunch communist, Valechko obviously did not question the wisdom of deporting kulaks and declasse elements to the least hospitable areas of the country. He limited himself to, den to denouncing the series of errors and cases of negligence that had, uh, that had led to the stunning collapse of a great project for the colonization of a Siberian region. After describing in detail what happened in the Z Nazino area, from the deportees' arrival to their evacuation, in a mad panic to the new settlement sites, Valechko analyzed the sequence of events leading to this situation and pinpointed two political errors revealed by the facts the local officials had absolutely failed to understand what they had to do with the individuals for whom they were responsible and their dreadful mismanagement of manpower had not ended with this island's evacuation since the settlers had continued 
to die in great numbers in their new settlement sites. According to Velichko, on August 20th, barely 2,200 people remained alive out of the 6,600 to 6,800 who had arrived from Tomsk. In his report, Velichko devoted a lengthy passage to the unjustified arrest and deportation of individuals so socially close to the Soviet government and even comrades, most of whom died because they were most vulnerable. He described in detail no fewer than 30 cases of individuals who had spontaneously come up to, to him to tell stories and ask that he help them get permission to return to Moscow or Leningrad. The journalist propagandist was the first bureaucrat who had taken the trouble to listen to and transmit their grievances. In his deposition before the Commission of Inquiry, Commander Frolov explained that Dolgoik had, expressed, had expressly forbidden the Commandantura's officials to receive any requests or complaints made by individuals who claimed to have been wrongly deported. If the latter presented a certificate, an attestation, or even identity, or, ugh, or even identity papers, these documents were to be immediately confiscated. Such papers could only have been stolen, Frolov said. One day a deportee came up to me, told me he was a candidate for membership in the party, and asked me which communist cell he should put himself down for. I asked to see his card. He gave it to me. It said that he had paid his dues for the first months of the current year. I took his card to the district committee party. There I was told this card must have been stolen. Imposters and masked enemies with party cards in their pockets, they're everywhere. The Siblog's officials concerned that some deportees might file written complaints had, however, little foundation. As Volichko noted in his report, even the Commandantura's bureaucrats write their budgets and their accounts on birch bark, a detail that tells us a great deal about the material poverty in this remote part of the Soviet world. Sent from Tomsk, Volichko, Volichko's long letter, about 20 pages to Stalin, arrived in Moscow at the beginning of September 1933. Stalin ordered that it be circulated among members of the Politburo, the signatures of Higanovich, Moltov, Kalinin, Kuybyshev, and Mikoyan appearing at the end of the letter show that the party's highest officials were aware of the Nazino affair. On September 23, the Politburo assigned a high official who was a member of the Central Supervisory Commission and an assistant to the People's Commissar for the Inspection of Workers and Peasants to look into the matter. He supervised the establishment of the Commission of Inquiry, headed by, Marxim, headed by Maxim Kovalev, to which he had already referred. This commission included officials of the party, the judiciary, the Ogpu, and the Gulag. The commission spent several weeks in the area evaluating the situation of the special settlers in the Commandanturas of the Narim region, checking the justification of the complaints of hundreds of survivors who said they had been deported for no reason, and questioning the main officials from the, command, from the commander Sepkov to the head of the Siblog about the Nazino affair. On the way to Nazino, the commission visited several settlement villages all of them in a terrible state of dilapidation and contrasted with official reports. In, Ber in Beryozovka, in Beryoz Beryozovka, out of a group of 682 deportees, 185 men and 213 women, 284 children, who had arrived from Tomsk two weeks earlier, 58 had already died. The situation was even worse in the settlement sites along the Nazina River, where the survivors of Death Island had been transferred. According to the commission's final report, the huts are half buried, a roof made of branches through which the autumn rains pour, no windows inside, 
rows of pallets with a little dry grass to serve as a blanket, half-naked, emaciated, dirty, lice-ridden individuals lying there. Outside the huts, the more vigorous ones warmed themselves around wood fires. When the local commander were, was asked, why do the deportees stay outside? He replied, all of the declasses are used to living around wood fires. They've always done that. They do it here too. We also went to the huts in which had been crowded people suffering from dysentery, tuberculosis, scurvy, and syphilis, along with severely emaciated individuals. They were all lying on pallets covered with a blanket of grass that, had, that hadn't been changed for weeks and that had emitted a pestilential, pestilential odor of manure. When we were asked, why are these individuals in such a state? We were told they had always been sick and emaciated and that in any case they could not be cared for because there was a lack of everything. We estimated that there were at least 800 bedridden sick people. A few rare able-bodied individuals were constantly bustling about building huts. At one settlement site, the commission noticed a piece of land that had been cleared and sown, about one hectare in area. During its inspection tour, the commission severely criticized the local officials of the party and the commandanturas who had accused of a loss of class feeling and moral, moral and political degeneracy. It suggested that this resulted from the prolonged isolation in a hostile environment. Its report emphasized that the communists in Narim region prefer hunting bears to assiduously, to assiduously reading the party's newspaper. In addition to inspecting the deportees, settlement sites, the commission was supposed to check the foundation for the complaints filed by hundreds of persons who claimed that they had been unjustly deported. In the course of three weeks spent in the area, the commission's members personally questioned 810 individuals. Of this number, 174 were freed of their status as labor colonists and sent back to Tomsk or Novosibirsk without, however, being authorized to go home, at least until a more detailed investigation of their case had been made. 231 were sent to Novosibirsk under escort for further investigation. The cases of 240 others were referred to along the aleatory bureaucratic control procedure that passed through the Siblog's usual channels and 165 were rejected. These figures clearly show that, in most cases examined, the commission members acknowledged, more or less explicitly, that in most of the, pro in most of the protests and challenges were well-founded. However, none of the persons wrongly deported was allowed to go home. And, of course, no compensation or indemnification of any kind was envisaged. Finally, the commission attempted to determine the number of survivors and to draw up a balance sheet for the operation of colonization begun several months earlier. In mid-October, of the 10,289 persons deported to the Alexandro Vachovskoya Kamandantura, there remained on site only 2,000. 225. In mid-September, shortly before the commission's arrival, 1,940 of the more able-bodied deportees had been transferred to the Siblog's labor camps. Thus, in this district alone, almost two-thirds of the contingent of deportees, 6,324 persons, had disappeared since the beginning of the deportation campaign in 1933. This was the conclusion drawn by Kovalev Commission and based, as the authors of reported 
of the report noted, not without reservations, on the figures that were unable to obtain from the local authorities. Nevertheless, no matter how imprecise these figures may be, their general magnitude is very eloquent. The commission estimated that the state of the 2,000 survivors as follows. 50% ill and bedridden, 34 to 40% in weakened condition, 10 to 15% or about 200 to 300 persons capable of working. Back in Alexandrovskoye on October 18, Kovalev telegraphed his initial conclusions to Matvey Berman, the head of the Gulag. It emerged that in order to avoid further deterioration of the situation of the special settlement who are still alive, there was henceforth no solution other than to rapidly examine the cases of the survivors, to let the least socially dangerous ones leave, forbidding them to reside in cities subject to special rules, to send them to to send the more dangerous ones back to the Tomsk camp, at least until spring, and to completely evacuate all the sites where the deportees in the 1933 contingent had been installed. These proposals were in fact similar to those made a few weeks earlier by Alexiev. After the most able-bodied deportees had been transferred to a labor camp. The transfer, which all the Siblogs officials had been requesting for months, confirmed the failure of the great plan for colonizing, of, for the colonization of the Siberian vastness by urban declasse elements that had been proposed by Heinrich Yagoda six months earlier. The commission submitted its report on October 31. It acknowledged that, essentially, the facts mentioned by Comrade Velich Velichko in his letter to J.V. Stalin were correct. However, the proposals formulated two weeks earlier by Kovalev, the commission's chairman, regarding the ultimate fate of the survivors of the Alexandro Vahavskoya Commandantura were not included in the final text. Obviously, no one had wanted to take responsibility for a new transfer of deportees to Tomsk. The city's authorities refused to accept any influx of de classe elements. As for the transit camp, it was completely saturated with 8,000 deportees, whom it had not been possible to send on to one of the commandanturas of the Narim region having to spend the winter there. The season, when the river was navigable, was coming to an end, and the wreck trans was bringing in its boats. The Karl Marx had just completed its last tomsk alexandrovskoya tomsk run. It was no longer possible to evacuate the survivors of Nazino to more hospitable places. The commission limited itself to expressing the hope that the Siblog would continue to take all measures that might improve living conditions for the special settlers, emphasizing that at the time of our departure, local officials were actively trying to respond to the commission's demands concerning the dispatch of the medicines, clothing, and precision provisions that would allow the special settlers to live a normal life on site until spring. On November 1st, the highest regional political authority, the Office of the Regional Committee of the Party of Western Siberia, headed by Robert Ike, met to discuss the Commission's report. The, resolu the resolution adopted at the conclusion of the meeting was essentially devoted to declaration of sanctions imposed on about 10 Siblog officials who had been in some way involved in the Nazino affair. Gorchkov and Dolgaik received severe reprimands, which did not prevent them from pursuing their brilliant careers in the Gulag bureaucracy. Dolgoik ended his career as head of the Gulag in early 1950s. The minor local officials were the most severely sanctioned. Not only Sapkov, Kolobyev, and Kuznetsov, but also Frolov were expelled from the party, arrested, 
and sent before the College of the Agpu in an extrajudicial panel authorized to punish crimes and offenses committed by Czechists. They were sentenced to terms of one to three years in camp for having sabotaged the implementation of the state's 1933 plan for colonizing the Narim region. Finally, about 15 villages, finally, about 15 village commanders and guards who had committed particularly serious abuses with regards to the special settlers, murders, blows, and injuries, were sent before an internal Ogpu disciplinary panel. The party of Western Siberia acknowledged the contingents of the de Classe deportees were completely unsuited for colonizing the Siberian Great North and, ex exported, and, exhorted, and exhorted the party's central committee not to send any further contingents of this kind to Western Siberia. Finally, the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative was requested to examine the question of the grounds. All right, guys, there's 22 seconds left in this. It's going to kick everyone off. And that's why I usually have Periscope up. So I'm going to try and get that going. But in the meantime, if you would, if you want to keep listening, go to my, the link in my Instagram bio and click it. That's going to bring you to my Periscope. And then you can continue watching this. So I'm going to try and get Periscope going right now. Sweet. We are back live on Periscope. Hopefully this continues to work. I'll go ahead and try and start another Instagram TV thing. Let's see. Let's do this. Let's take this guy. Ugh. Come here. Uh, yeah, I'll just share the story. Fuck it. All right. I'm going to start another Instagram just in case. But yes. Let's continue this book here on Periscope. Let's go live. Checking connection, you're now live. All right, getting back to it. No big deal. Instagram's just not catching up with the times. Let's see. Things are just getting juicy. Here we go. Okay, so yeah, these people are all getting sentenced to disciplinary shit. In addition, the office of the regional committee of the party of Western Siberia acknowledged that the contingents of de classe deportees were completely unsuited for colonizing the Siberian Great North and exhorted the party's central committee not to send any further contingents of this kind to Western Siberia. Further contingents of this kind of Western... Oh, yeah. Finally, the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative was requested to examine the question of the grounds for the continuing presence of de classe elements in Alexandra Vohovskoya Commandantura with a view to definitely... To definitive... To definite... To definitively... Jesus... Continuing presence of de classe elements in the Alexandro 
Vakov, Vakovovskaya Commandantura with a view to definitively evacuating them to other sites. With this torturous formulation which reflects the dead and at which the grandiose plan for using special settlers and labor colonists to develop this inhospitable regions of the USSR had arrived. The Nazino affair came to an end. All right, so I see in a chapter five, but I feel like this needs a brief discussion because a lot of shit happened in that chapter. Basically, they <laughs> they went out to the countryside and they decided, hey, we're gonna uh, we're gonna go and colonize ba the Siberian. Siberia is basically an unlivable um, place. The taiga is like can, picture a desert, but it's just like ice for thousands of miles. And like the temperatures are like negative 60 um, during the night. So they, they take all these people who are doing just fine. They bring them out to, to Siberia in hopes of colonizing this place. This is coming from Stalin himself. And uh, not only do they not think this through, but they, they had prepared very poorly. Um, they were supposed to have a certain amount of stuff per person, and uh, they did not have that stuff. They basically sent, so they sent a bunch of criminals in their eyes out there. The declasse elements that they're talking about, that's basically, I mean, it could be anyone ranging from an actual criminal to somebody who forgot their papers at home to somebody who didn't forget their papers at home, showed them and they just didn't feel like, you know, believing them. They're like, oh, these are fake papers, fuck you, you're coming. So they sent criminals out there in their eyes, some criminals, some good people, and some in the middle, and they brought them out there with nothing. They were forced to eat each other to stay alive, and then, obviously, this plan failed. Then Stalin takes the individuals responsible for carrying out his tasks, says that they didn't do it good enough. And for this, they were all sentenced to times in the gulag. Um, so they're, they're fucked if they do, fucked if they don't. Uh, it's an, an incredible, ridiculous thing. So let me see how long the conclusion is. Maybe I'll just knock this out now. Yeah, I don't know. There's like an epilogue. Okay, there's notes. Conclusion is like a few pages, so yeah. We'll just do the conclusion now, too. All right, here we go. So this is gonna explain everything that can be explained. Conclusion. The Cannibal Island episode is exceptionally well-documented in comparison with other mass deportations. What can we learn from it? First of all, it sheds light on the bloody implementation of a utopia, a vast enterprise of social engineering, of bureaucratic and police planning, and sought to cleanse and purify certain Soviet spaces, notably urban spaces, of their declasse and socially harmful elements by deporting them to Siberia's garbage can areas. It also allows us to understand better the functioning about which we still know little of the system of special settlements, the second gulag, that developed and prospered for a quarter of a century alongside the system of labor camps. The Nazino affair, which reveals the climate of extreme violence that overcame the Soviet Far East in the early 1930s also suggests that what happened in largely unsupervised areas of the Soviet periphery and at the level of the violence that reimagined in them. Finally, 
It constitutes a remarkable laboratory for the anthropological observation of a group of individuals plunged into an extreme situation that generated regressions and transgressions as the end result of a veritably of a veritable process of de-civilization. The grandiose plan proposed in early 1933 by officials of the political police and approved by Stalin was the natural extension, a second, still more comprehensive stage of a project begun three years earlier and for, most, and for the most part completed. The liquidation of the Kulaks as a class. This project launched at the beginning of the 1930 had a twofold objective to extract, that was the term used in the confidential directives, the elements that might resist the forced collectivization of the countryside and to colonize the vast inhospitable areas of Siberia, the Great North, the Urals, and Kazakhstan. The first objective responded to the vision clearly expressed by Bolsheviks as soon as they came to power, according to which peasant society, which was shot through with class antagonism, contained elements irredeemably hostile to the regime. The second objective was part of a vast plan to develop, by means of deported manpower, a certain number of deserted regions, at a point when the regime was throwing itself into the construction of socialism. These objectives were based on the conviction that the new state, because it was based on scientific knowledge and the mastery of laws governing the historical development of societies, was capable of shaping the latter, of excising from them hostile, parasitical, and harmful elements that were polluting the new socialist society that was being built. In this social engineering, the number culture that had invaded the most diverse domains of political life played a central role, producing dekulakization quotas, detailed plans for the eradication of malaria, curves for ending illiteracy, and five-year production targets. This is shown by the dekulakization quotas assigned to each region in 1930 to 1931 and the countless deportation plans worked up by various departments of accounting and monitoring in the OGPU's Central Special Settlements Office. The obsession with numbers is discernible in all the sources on which this book is based. Overall numbers planned in Moscow, numbers negotiated by local authorities, statistical plans of the declasse elements to be settled, sent to the local leaders of the commandanturas, the percentage of emaciated or lice-ridden individuals put into the deportation convoys, records broken, the head of the special settlements for Western Siberia proudly announced that in 65 to 70 days, they had succeeded in colonizing the Narim region, which the Tsarist regime had not been able to do in 350 years. The omnipresent invasive number, culture, is the mark of a utopian mastery over the body, social, broken down, into de-individualized masses to be processed to adopt a vocabulary used by both the decision makers and the exec executors and the execu and the executors of the various deportation projects along with this number culture emerged a veritable planning aesthetics perceptible in the area that concerns us here in the utopian goal of creating a perfectly ordered system of settlement colonies and special villages managed in a military repressive way. Bureaucratic records are full of plans, schemes, and projects showing how the experimental special villages were supposed ideally to function with their model, the standardized huts, their disinfection stations, the obsession the obsession with hygiene is found everywhere. Their punctilious internal regulations 
which determined even the kind of literature that would be disturbed, would be distributed to the deportees and their structures of surveillance re-regimented and re-educated through labor. In the initial stage of the great turning point, the special village of settlement colony was even considered a possible substitute for the camp, as it's shown by the astonishing project elaborated in April 1930, the head of the Ogpu, by the head of the Ogpu, uh, the question of the camps must be reconsidered. Today, a camp is nothing but a conglomeration of deportees, whose labor power we exploit from day to day. But the officers no long-term prospects either for us. But that offers no long-term prospects, either for us or for the detainees. The camps must be transformed into settlement colonies. Here is my idea. Transform all the detainees into colonists. We should proceed this way. We assign to a specific group of detainees, let's say, 1,500 persons, a small area of forest, and we have them construct shelters to live in. Those who want to will be able to have their families join them. Each village will be run by an official. A village will consist of 200 to 300 families. When they have finished their woodcutting work, they can work in their vegetable gardens, raise pigs, mow fields, go fishing. At first, we will provide them with food, but soon they will get along by themselves. Deportees and exiles will be treated like the detainees. That is, they will be transformed into colonists. In winter, all the colonists will work at woodcutting or other kinds of labor, depending on the orders we have given them. The regions to be colonized are immensely rich in oil and in coal, and I am convinced that within a few years, we can make these settlements, these settlement colonies into real proletarian cities. The third part of this utopia was pseudo-categorization, was pseudo-categorization of the stigmatized groups to be expelled from the countryside or the cities and deported. These groups were put in a camp after being subjected to an extrajudicial administrative procedure or simply rounded up by the police. The explosive combination of plans categorizing, or the explosive combination of plans specifying numerical targets and a totally arbitrary categorization of the victims, a categorization whose interpretation was left to local police officials, or even in the case of the D. Kulak guys Asian campaign, ordinary neighbors seeking to settle old scores could only lead to the most complete arbitrariness. Thus, far from being the planned operation based on clear objectives and controlled quotas, that the Ogpu's leadership dreamed of, dequilicization turned into a chaotic and largely unmonitored process. In their internal reports, the leaders of the polit political police constantly complained about the local authorities, whom they accused of not arresting those who should be arrested, which was hardly surprising since no one had ever defined exactly what a kulak was. The same scenario was repeated in 1933, the inflation of the pseudo-categories of declasse and socially harmful elements, naturally allowing absolute arbitrary interpretations of what they meant. Still, more than other roundups and deportations that took place in the spring of 1933, regarding which we unfortunately have very fragmentary information, the Nazino affair permits us to gain a greater insight into this environment and the arbitrary police actions that took place in it to meet the targets and provide the resulting figures. Police officials did not hesitate to arrest and deport the elderly, the ill, mothers with young children, and other ordinary citizens whose only offense was to have left home without their papers or to have raised their voices. In turn, these cases of the dizziness of success and administrative enthusiasm 
to adopt some of Stalin's favorite formulas set in motion a whole mechanism of bureaucratic, bureaucratic oversight and verification. However, the latter's goals, the latter's goal was not to redress an injustice or reestablish a kind of legality, but rather to provide a political explanation for a great utopian projects of developing inhospitable territories and for the system's malfunctions. The Nazino affair sheds light on these, mal on these malfunctions, the bureaucratic relationship between the center and the periphery, and the various actors involved in the special settlements system, and the outline of a rational and hierarchical categorization of Soviet territories, the goal of the great campaign of passportization and deportation in 1933, Siberia, the Great North, and the Kazakh and Kazakhstan were seen as garbage can areas in which all the elements polluting socialism showcase cities, Moscow, Leningrad, and other large cities, subject to special rules, would be dumped. For Siberian political officials, the influx of hundreds of thousands of social pariahs, a significant number of whom escaped any supervision after they arrived, had, as the Ogpu's plenipotentiary representative for Western Siberia bluntly explained, zero value in terms of economic exploitation and development, as was a major source of social disorder and insecurity. For his part, Robert Icke, the chief of the party's f official for Siberia, believe wait, the chief party official for Siberia believed that in no area is the gap between the center and the periphery so great as in the matters concerning the special settlers. <laughs> On the one hand, there was a tendency to manipulate the numbers, to elaborate grandiose plans, and on the other, an obligation to install masses on people in the taiga in record time and without material to support and to prevent them from escaping. Once the incessant bargaining in which the regions, it has to be admitted, had little room to man for maneuver, a total absence of coordination among, their, among the countless bureaucracies involved in policing and managing the deportees, contradictory instructions, constant setbacks, and all of this aggravated by the remoteness of the areas concerned and the lamentable state of the communications. If we add these structural factors to the high-pressure temporal imperative, the massive deportations of 1933 had to be carried out in only two to three months, weather constraints playing a major role. We have all the ingredients allowing us to understand the chain of events that led to the fatal deportation and abandonment on the island of Nazino, thanks to the documents produced for the commission of inquiry set up at the time we can now also understand the role played by the officials involved at all levels, their degree of autonomy, and their way of interpreting and implementing the project worked out in Moscow. It is clearly that these officials had only a vague notion of the project's goals. Project's goals. For the most part, they were confused by orders and plans that were constantly changing. 25,000 deportees to be settled in such and such a commandantura, then 15,000, then 5,000, and didn't know what to do with the contingents of urban declasses for which they were responsible. Should they always be sent somewhere else, put out to graze, or finished off? To adopt a new, to adopt a few of the blunt expressions used by the Siblog's lower echelon personnel. In the eyes of the people implementing the project at the base level, wasn't that generalized carelessness wait in the eyes of the people implementing the project at the base level wasn't the generalized carelessness that accompanied the whole enterprise from Moscow down to Alexandrovskoya the strongest possible incentive to physically eliminate these elements who appeared moreover to be so alien 
the story of Nazino has a third aspect. What it tells us about these remote, immense, and violent areas that constituted the Soviet Far East. They were insecure areas, poorly controlled by authorities, where marginal elements and outlaws were concentrated, where armed gang attacks isolated Kolkhozis and killed the few representatives of the Soviet government where everyone was armed, where human life had scarcely any value, and where humans, rather than animals, were sometimes hunted since the beginning of the 1930s as a result of the destruction of the Siberian peasantry, which was no doubt the most enterprising in all Russia. This area had been overcome by extreme poverty, shortages, and hunger that raised still higher the level of ambient violence. <laughs> These were areas where the state, in sense defined by Max Weber, a system that successfully claims the right to rule a territory by virtue of its monopoly on the use of legitimate physical violence, was virtually absent. It was into this explosive cauldron that hundreds of thousands of outlaws were deported. Should we be surprised that every year one-third of these deportees died or escaped? This rate of loss seems not to have much disturbed the decision-makers who regarded it as not particularly high in view of the exceptional scope of the enterprise undertaken, an enterprise that was part of the party line and to which one had therefore to adhere. No matter what doubts might be expressed by this or that local official, in Nazino, as the result of a set aggravating circumstances, a group of exceptionally deprived and ill-suited individuals sent without the slightest supervision and unloaded in particularly inhospitable places, two-thirds of the deportees vanished in a few weeks. This bloody episode is an extreme, limiting case that took place not only as part of the implementation of a utopia of the functioning of a bureaucratic, of the functioning of a bureaucratic and repressive system that of the special settlements, but also in an area saturated with violence. On the island of Nazino, people ceased to be people. They turned into jackals, wrote the journalist propagandist Velichko in his letter to Stalin, probably unaware that he was paraphrasing the famous homo hominim lupus. This leads us to a fourth aspect of the episode of Cannibal Island that we have hardly touched upon so far, largely because of the specific character of the sources used here, which are more suitable for an accurate, for an account of bureaucratic malfunctions. Nazino was also a place of decivilization. Decivilization on the level of material culture, the most striking evidence for which is the resurgence of the very ancient practice of writing on birch bark, still attested in the medieval ruse. Decivilization as well on the level of humane relationships, too few in number, but extremely revelatory. revelatory. The statements and acts of the rep representatives of the Soviet government, local officials of the party, and the Siblog's commandant tours, and other guardians responsible for monitoring the depressive, the deportees and keeping them under surveillance, lay bare extremely violent relationships based on transforming the deportees into animals. In Nazino, we see the result, we see the resuscitation of a pastoral order from the earliest times, guardian shepherds grazing their animals, beating them for the slightest offense, training them to row and to retrieve game. Those who refused to comply with this order or try to escape were hunted like wild animals, gunned down as dangerous and bestial predators who ate flesh. In a Zeno, a modernizing utopia of purifying and civilizing social engineering 
under complete control, paradoxically caused a whole nest of archaisms to rise to the surface. In this sense, this episode mirrored the Stalinist vision and its reality as a whole. Okay, that is, I think that's it. There's an epilogue. Maybe I'll read the epilogue tomorrow. Yeah, let's do, let's do the epilogue tomorrow. And then we'll do a discussion, how about that? We'll do an epilogue tomorrow at 9 p.m. And then uh, we'll discuss and you guys can like ask questions and I can share my uh, opinions and shit or you can share your opinions and shit um, if you want to catch up to where we are uh, the whole book is basically so I've been doing this for the past week or two I've done a chapter a night at nine and I've recorded since I'm doing an audio book I recorded each chapter and I release each chapter on YouTube um, so there's a playlist called Cannibal Island Death in a Siberian Gulag on Facebook or on YouTube under Carter Banks. Um, if you just type in Cannibal Island Carter Banks, the, uh, the playlist will pop up and you can listen to everything from the preface to chapter one, two, three, four, five, etc. And then, uh, get caught up.